Chapter Four of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fourth Reel. Hollywood, June sixteenth. Ma chérie, French, which I am being taught by a German cameraman. I just had to quit Keystone. Art may live long, but I won't if I make a darn martyr of myself for five dollars a day. I didn't mind being thrown in the tank and nearly drowned. Nor did I get sore when they poured soup all over my dress and then hit me with a turkey. I was willing to forget those little things for the sake of the drama. But when Roscoe R. Buckle was to jump out of a three story building and I was supposed to have caught him in my waiting arms, I resigned. That is, Mr. Sennett told me to get out, and I got out. And after I got out, I resigned immediately, although I don't know whether he heard me. If I hadn't have objected, I was supposed to catch Roscoe and fall backwards into a wash tub. That made me turn my back to the camera. And Clara Bell, I ask you how you can get any soulfulness or temperament into your work when you got to fall into a tub with your back to the camera. Roscoe was consideration itself. He said he would let me jump out of the third story window if I would stay, and he would catch me on the first bounce. And then Clara Bell, snakes ain't actors. The profession is overcrowded enough as it is without bringing in any more reptiles. And that is just what Raymond Hitchcock did. I had no scenes with him, but the very thought of having them around upset my delicate nerves. I put Roscoe out of my life because he would tell Ford stories, and any man that will do that is not a suitable mate for a woman of genius. Mr. Arbuckle was all cut up when I quit. He breathed in my ear just before I left that he never, never in all his life enjoyed throwing things at anybody as he did at me. He said he could get more expression and emotional feeling into a brick coming my way than with any other actress he had ever met. He certainly is a grand man. I suppose you've seen an item in the Grundy Center paper, that Universe Beauty special passed through there, en route here. My dear, I was down to the train to see them come in. Far be it from me to denounce my own sex, but if I was the other candidates, I would insist on a recount. It is not for me to praise myself, dear, but if I haven't got it over that whole crowd like a tent for looks, I'll go back to murdering the strip tickets. Now don't breathe this to a soul, Clarabelle, but certain parties out here, jealous of my success and the sensation I've made, have been knocking me to the directors. I know the hussy, and when the moon is right, I am going to alter her map so there will be no chance for a retake. I do not believe in fighting or even quarreling with low common people. Once a lady, always a lady, so be assured that I will not soil my hands on her. I will just one day wrap a stage brace around her summer furs. Cheap cat skin, my dear. So hard, she will think she played the lead in a four real earthquake. How are all the rubes back in Grundy Center? My God, how I pity them. Lovingly yours, Molly. P.S. I just seen by the paper that. Wait till I get that paper to see how it's spelt. Geraldine Farrar, the grand opera prima donna, is going to sing for the pictures at the Lasky studio, and I am going right out there and accept an engagement, if it is offered me. You know, dear, I sang illustrated ballads between reels at Grundy Center, and I'm sure that the presence of a sister artist there would make Mrs. Farrar feel more at home. Hollywood, June twenty ninth. Dear Clara Bell, the grandest news. Miss Farrar and me are working together in the same picture, and not a bit of jealousy. I don't know the name of the picture, but it's just grand. Costumes and knives and donkeys and goats, etc., and everything. The scenes is laid in some WAP country, where colored clothes is popular. And you know me in red, Clara Bell. When I came on first time in my costume, everybody just quit acting. As soon as I had of seen Miss Farrar was here. I beat it right out to the Lasky studio and told Peggy Powell I would accept an engagement in her company. What, you would really consent to work with Miss Farrar, says Mrs. Powell. Certainly, even though she isn't one of us screen artists, answered I promptly. I am a graduate, which is more than she can say. Here is my diploma. Line forms on the left, says Mrs. Powell. Can you play an Italian? My favorite flower is garlic, answered I, and I was engaged for Miss Farrar's support. Miss Farrar has a beautiful dressing room right near mine. It has a piano and everything just lovely, and she practices in there every morning. I told Mr. Horwitz I guessed I would have to practice too, to have my voice cultivated for the pictures, and he promised to get me a mouth organ. After he had of went away, I thought it over, and now I ask you, Clara B., how can I chorkle like a thrush and accompany myself on a mouth organ? I asked Mr. Wyckoff how it could have been done, and he said, Take a double exposure. Percy told me not to sing at all, as the light was getting bad. Percy is only a cameraman, dearie, but he is the soul of a true artist, 
and unless he can get a backlight on something, his whole day is spoiled. I believe I could care for him, if it wasn't for his hair. Red, my dear. I was terrifically disappointed in Miss Farrar. She's not like a prima donna at all. That is, she's not like I'd be if I had the praise of thousands at my feet. I can see a director telling me what to do, and she hasn't even a velvet carpet from her dressing room to the stage. And her dress. Let me tell you about her dress. Cotton, my dear, and cheap at that. Will you believe me when I told you that Sears Roebuck wouldn't know it as the last year's model? If I had her salary, silks and satins for me, and a gleam with precious jewels to boot, and never would I step under a diffuser, unless summoned by the director himself. And then if I didn't feel like it, I would recline in my boudoir and tell him to change the hair on one of the extries before I sauntered forth. She goes right ahead and does scene after scene without resting, just one spasm after another. You know no one of her rank can do that, and maintain her artistic poise. And if I do have to say it, in some parts of my chosen profession, I am a whole lot ranker than she is. If I would have been her, I would have had a chocolate sundae served me by a livered servant, after every big spell. And as for singing Clara Bell, would you believe it when I tell you that she don't make faces, nor suck in her breath, nor nothing to show that she is working at all? I'm a judge of music, as all Grundy Center has admitted, and I will say that she has a good voice, even though it isn't loud. I know because I was listening to her practice, and there were several places where she could have yelled right out. But she didn't do it. Maybe she wasn't feeling well, or maybe this is the new school. I don't know as to that, but I do know I was educated in the old-fashioned yell opera technique, and I don't regret it. You know what great artist it was who complimented my vocal organ by saying I had the loudest range he had ever heard. Still, I enjoyed assisting her here. Charity has taught me to be kind to others, and help them all I can, even though I can't sometimes see their stuff. I don't believe in familiarity, so I keep my distance in our scenes together. As I have said, I enjoyed the whole engagement. It was a whole day. When the picture is released, my dear, look for me in the blue dress right behind the star. I am about forty feet away, and there are fifteen people between us, and I am faced the other way. But if anybody moved out of the way during the picture, you can see who it is, I guess. By the way, during that scene, Mr. DeMille paid me the most delicate little compliment in that charming way of his. I started to have faced the camera, and he said, Girlie, don't do that. Your back is far more expressive. It was done in that gracious manner of nature's nobleman, and so sincere. For a moment I was thrilled, and if somebody hadn't to push the mule cart on my corns, I might have blushed. Dearie, I could learn to care for that man, if he wasn't so careless in his clothes. He wears a rough shirt and boots. But believe me, if I came from the metropical opera like Miss Farrar, nobody would direct me, unless he was within his Prince Albert. I like the artistic air of the Lasky studio. It is so soothing to my nerves. I am in my proper spear, and you don't have to jump into no tanks or do nothing rough. And I certainly was the photograph of a lady in that red dress. I think I will ignore all other, and become a regular member of the Lasky company. I know I could get in if the fence wasn't so darn high. Yours as before, Molly. P.S. When you see me in the Watt picture, don't forget to look at Farrar. She don't do much, but what she does is all right, I guess. It must be, or Mr. DeMille would have had a retake. Oh, why doesn't he wear a Prince Albert? M. End of chapter 4